Interstate 110 in Los Angeles, featuring your typical Los Angeles traffic, which can get a bit uh, cramped. So here's a brilliant idea. How about we add another 650,000 people here? Well, that's what LA did in 1984 when it hosted the Summer Olympics and welcomed 650,000 visitors to its congested roads. And yeah, many predicted that this was the perfect recipe for a traffic disaster. But what happened instead? Well, I'll let these guys take it from here. Tell me, Commander Street, what does it look like so far? Well, surprisingly, uh, during most of the rush hour to the, up to the moment here, things have been quite, quite a bit lighter than usual. Normally, we have a lot of congestion during this time. I mean, well, you had a chance to take a look at the traffic, and a quick word from our traffic expert flying with Judd was that, that the traffic is not as heavy as they anticipated. And that has been the case for just about every dire threat they said was going to take place in these Olympics. It just has not happened. To begin, I think it's important that we set the scene here. The Olympics are huge events, but they're also incredibly time-sensitive events. Athletes, officials, media, workers, and oh yeah, hundreds of thousands of spectators have to move between different competitions at multiple different venues at very specific times. Check out the swimming schedule for London's 2012 Olympics. Each event from the men's 100 meter butterfly to the women's 100 meter freestyle is planned down to the minute. If an athlete misses their event because of traffic, they're just disqualified. The stakes are high and there is very little room for error. Plus, the whole world is watching. So because of that, there is a lot of pressure on host cities to get their traffic under control during the Olympics. And that results in some very interesting ideas. One solution, of course, is to think big. Massive transportation investments have been a common part of hosting the Olympics. Tokyo introduced the Shinkansen bullet train for the 1964 Olympics, Barcelona built its ring road for the 1992 Olympics, and Vancouver got the Canada line for the 2010 Olympics. But these huge investments are really just a small part of managing traffic during the Olympics. You see, the real work isn't so much about building new things as it is changing people's behavior. Beijing, July 20th, 2008, a city that normally sees 3.3 million vehicles every day. But for the Summer Olympics, it took half of these cars off the roads. How? An odd even car rationing policy. Basically, if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could drive one day, and if it ended in an even number, you could drive every other day. It was considered so successful that it's still used by the city of Beijing today. Now, if all that sounds a bit uh, heavy handed, there is another way of making sure traffic doesn't get in the way of the Olympics. It's simple, really. Close the roads. Yes, recent Olympic host cities have actually closed down road space to the public to create Olympic lanes. These lanes can only be used for transporting Olympic athletes, officials, dignitaries, and media, guaranteeing a reliable and exclusive trip to all of the venues. Every host city of the last couple decades has used them. Sydney, Salt Lake City, Athens, Turin, Beijing, London, Rio de Janeiro, and here. Yes, for the 2010 Winter Olympics in my home city of Vancouver, this street, Hastings Street, was an Olympic lane. It was part of a much larger network of lanes that crisscrossed downtown Vancouver before connecting to the east, west, and south ends of the city. That wasn't all. Vancouver's Olympic street closures also included removing parking spaces along several downtown streets, creating pedestrian-only streets, and completely closing down the Dunsmuir and Georgia viaducts, a major arterial into the city. Now, at first glance, this idea can seem completely counterintuitive, if not outright selfish. You've got hundreds of thousands of extra people moving around your city, and you're taking away road space? Unsurprisingly, Olympic lanes are controversial just about everywhere they go, sparking fears about traffic and sometimes even triggering protests. During London's Olympics, they were nicknamed Olympic VIP lanes, viewed as a perk for the Olympic elites that left plebs like you and me stuck in a traffic nightmare. Yeah, the optics aren't great, but more often than not, that traffic nightmare never comes. In Vancouver, the Olympic lanes and street closures reduced our working road space by 20%. And yet, during the Olympics, the city accommodated an extra 177,000 people traveling downtown with no reports of major traffic jams. How did that happen? Well, people just adapted. 
During the 2010 Olympics, commuters changed their travel behavior en masse. The number of vehicles traveling to and from downtown Vancouver decreased by a third. At the same time, the city added 180 more buses, introduced a streetcar line, and extended SkyTrain and C-Bus hours. As a result, transit trips downtown increased by a third, and the number of pedestrian and cycling trips more than tripled. Vancouver's story isn't unique. You'll find similar versions of it in most post cities of the last few decades, from Barcelona to London. The Olympics, instead of creating massive traffic jams, creates massive changes to the way people commute. Now, of course, it's not that simple. Traffic is a really complex issue, and behind the scenes of each Olympics is a ton of planning by public officials and transportation planners to prepare for these events. And it doesn't always work out. In the cases of Atlanta and Rio de Janeiro, the Olympics appear to have made traffic considerably worse. That being said, I think there are still a couple lessons here. The obvious one is that we could be using our roads much more efficiently. In fact, we could even afford to close a lot of them down if more people were using public transit, walking, or cycling. But for me, the real lesson of the Olympics is that we're much more capable of change than we often give ourselves credit for. Changing our commuting habits or even getting rid of traffic doesn't always require massive investments of money or time. The Olympics demonstrate that it can happen overnight, or at least for two weeks. Is this where the epilogue goes? Okay, I'm just gonna give it a go. So in Vancouver, these temporary street closures for the Olympics have actually paved the way for more permanent changes on the ground. Hastings Street, once an Olympic lane, now has a rapid bus lane. Hornby Street, which saw parking removed during the Olympics, is now a bike lane. And the viaducts that were closed to traffic completely for the Olympics may soon be demolished to create a park and condominiums.